it's great to be back with everybody after a week off of Webinar Wednesday. My thanks to my colleague, Ivan Manuel, for filling in last week in a great discussion about apprenticeships. And if you didn't see it live, I uh, haven't had a chance to see it, would certainly recommend that people go back and take a look at last week's episode. It's great to be back on this third session of our 10-part series on industrial training. Today, talking about the secret to retaining great employees. Now, I have to tell you that I spent time all over the Midwest, all over the United States, working with industrial employers who are trying to figure out how to upskill their existing employees, trying to plan for the future, understanding that their viability as a company absolutely rests in their ability to train their incumbent workers. And I hear all kinds of interesting reasons why or why not people are interested in industrial training. We'll cover some of those today. One of my favorite stories is I was spending some time with a friend of mine a couple of years ago, and I was talking with him about the importance of training his employees, of issuing third-party credentials, of understanding what they should know, upskilling them so they can remain relevant in an ever-changing world of industrial work. You know what his reason for not being sure that he should be training his employees was? He said, I worry that if I train my employees and I give them access to third-party credentials, that they will be even more marketable to other manufacturers and I'll risk losing them as my employees. So I paused for a moment and I said to him, you know, that's a really good point. In fact, you are way better off making sure that your employees are as dumb as possible so that they'll never be able to work anywhere else. He paused a moment. He smiled at me, recognizing the folly in what he had said. The truth of the matter is, of course, we need to train our existing employees, and we shouldn't be worried that training them might lead them to go work somewhere else. In fact, the opposite, believe it or not, is true. Let's start with this, though. Is it okay to stay in the same job for your whole career? Is it okay to stay in the same role for your whole career? The answer to that question is absolutely yes. I talk to people who work in welding departments, in a welding booth. I talk to people who are machinists, who are setup people, who take care of the neatness and organization in a plant. And they say, I love my job. I don't really want to be promoted. I really don't want to do anything else. And the answer is that is absolutely okay. Now, they have to be a little bit concerned about whether manufacturing technology will advance at a rate where their skills are no longer relevant. But there is nothing wrong if you love your job was settling and saying, this is what, where I want to spend my entire career. But that, while it is true of many people, it is not true for many others. And as we talk about and think about the reasons that people might move on, no training them for a position that requires higher skill is not a reason they're going to leave the organization. But the opposite, opposite of that can be true. Why do people leave their jobs? You know, there are a ton of studies about this topic. You can look online and you can Google this. You can put it into your search engine. There is a million studies, it seems like, on why people leave their jobs. And while every study is a little bit different, while every conclusion is a little bit different, there is one theme. There is one reason that shows up on almost every, if not every list. And it looks like this. Why do people leave their jobs? One of the key reasons is a lack of perceived career growth. Now, they might explain it a little bit differently. One survey says they're bored and unchallenged in their work. There's another one that says that they don't feel like they have any room to grow in the organization. There isn't any way up. There's no opportunity for me to be promoted. But the nature of my work isn't quite right for me. I want to do something different, but I don't necessarily have the skills or the opportunity to change what I'm doing day in and day out. I feel underutilized. I want to do more for the organization. I don't think they're getting as much out of me as I could give. There aren't any opportunities for advancement. Another one says no growth opportunity, a very similar theme. I'm seeking more challenging work. I want to be challenged in my work. Lack of growth and development opportunities. Do you see that theme? Do you see how in every one of these surveys that same idea comes up? People don't leave their jobs because we train them for greater responsibility. In fact, one of the key reasons people leave their jobs is because we don't train them for positions that allow them to grow in their careers. So as people who lead businesses, as managers, as chief executive officers, as chief operating officers, vice presidents of operations, those of us leading manufacturing operations, if we want to retain our people, 
the secret to retaining our people. If we want to retain our people, we must show them a path to the future. But for them to realize that path, we must be willing to invest in training. You see, it's not just enough for us to want to promote our people. It's not just enough for them to want to grow in positions of responsibility. <clears throat> we need to have an ability to train them for those new positions on their pathway so that when they reach that position, when they're ready to be promoted, they have the skills, they have the abilities that are necessary for them to be promoted in that new role. So training is really, really important. But as I talk to manufacturers, I get some similar themes that recur in the reasons that they aren't interested sometimes in investing in training. We talked about one of them, and we actually took care of that misconception, which is if I train my people, they may go work somewhere else. The opposite is true. Here are some of the other common objections that I get when working with manufacturing executives, industrial executives, about why they aren't willing to retrain to skill up their workforce. One of them is, look, we are already working crazy hours. Do you know what it's like in manufacturing right now? Companies working their employees 50, 60, 70 hours a week, working weekends in the middle of summer, working overtime during the week and on weekends. We're already working crazy hours. We can't invest in taking our people off the floor. For that matter, our on-time delivery is already suffering. We're having these challenges in our supply chain. We need to make sure that our people are available as soon as that material arrives on the shop floor so that we can manufacture that product and get it to our customer. We're dealing with equipment downtime issues. We're running our equipment to the bone. The equipment is shutting down. We need to make sure our maintenance personnel are available 24 seven. We can't take them away from those responsibilities. We don't have enough people already. You want me to invest in training my people two hours a week, 100 hours a year? I already don't have enough people. I'm too busy recruiting new people to invest in my training program. I'm having all these quality issues. We're passing bad parts. I need my people in quality on the floor, making sure we're driving quality into the system. These are the reasons that people tell me they can't train their people. Well, on a previous episode of Webinar Wednesday in this 10-part series, I believe it was our first episode in this series, we talked about how so many of the problems in manufacturing, this is a graph inspired, by the way, by the book, It's Not Luck by Goldratt great book, go ahead and read it. But so many of our problems in manufacturing, so many of our problems in industry have at the root cause ineffective training programs. So all of these reasons people tell us that they can't train, we can't absorb new work, we have, our overtime costs are too high, we're already passing bad parts, we have equipment downtime. These are not only unacceptable reasons and excuses for not investing in employee training, in many cases, they are the key reasons that the lack of employee training are the key reasons that these problems are occurring in the first place. Training is something that fixes these problems. These problems are not a reason not to invest in training. So like we said, if we want to retain our people, we must show them a path to the future. But for them to realize that path, we must be willing to invest in training. But it's not just that. It's not just that we train them, but it's what we train them on. You know, one of the things that we have to think about is that this problem in manufacturing, this problem of a lack of skilled talent, this problem of a lack of a skilled workforce is way too big for us to handle in some cases. The problem is way too big. 2.4 million open positions in advanced manufacturing over the course of the next several years. That is a big, big problem. And the stakes of not filling those positions are way too high. The truth of the matter is that manufacturing and industry are the lifeblood of our economy in the United States. For every one manufacturing job we create, we can create another one and a half to three jobs in other parts of the economy. Manufacturing is one of those areas where true wealth can still be built. The stakes of not having a vibrant manufacturing economy here in the United States are way too high. The problem of a lack of people is way too big for us to have any waste in our training programs. So in the same sense that we drive waste out of manufacturing processes, we need to make sure that there, we eliminate as much waste from our training programs as we possibly can so that we're sacrificing the least amount of time on the shop floor to train our people. 
And so we're going to talk today about how we do that. Here's how we don't do that. What we don't do is go back to that old way of training people where we take the videotape, we put it in the VCR, and every single person in the classroom learns exactly the same thing. We talked about this two weeks ago. We can't have a training program where somebody who has been with us for two weeks is learning exactly the same thing as someone who's been with us for 20 years. Because that person who's been with us for two weeks is way over their head. That person who's been with us for 20 years is bored by the content because they already know it. A one-size-fits-all training program will not work in the world of manufacturing. Instead, as we talked about, we have to start where the knowledge ends and the learning opportunity begins. We have to select exactly that point. We do that by using e-assessment. We talked about that two weeks ago. But then it's not just understanding where the knowledge ends and the learning opportunity begins. We have to make sure we understand exactly what to train our people. Why? As we said, the problem is too big. The stakes are too high for us to have any waste in our training programs. Training our people on something that isn't relevant to their job is waste because it doesn't drive our organization forward. So we're going to talk today about five tips for waste-free training. If the secret to retaining our people is proper training programs, how do we create a training program in a way that we do it as efficiently as possible? that we don't risk having people out of the manufacturing environment for any longer than they absolutely need to be in order to train. The first thing is to match the competencies to the job and to the market that the company does business in. I work with manufacturers and industrial employers, again, all over the United States on programs like this. And I can tell you that what somebody needs to know to be successful in the world of construction is different than what they need to know to be successful in the world of tool, tool making or of running the machining centers that use the tools that the tool maker manufactures and produces. What we need to know in welding is different from all of these. And certainly what we need to know in heavy equipment operation, or for that matter, being a technician on a piece of heavy equipment, working with hydraulics, working with electrical systems, all of these markets are different. That's one of the reasons that our community and technical colleges here in the United States have advisory boards and why they are responsive to their local employers, because needs in different regions and needs in different markets for training and the talent that they require to be successful in their businesses is different in almost every case. There are similarities. They all need to know measurement. They all have print reading. They all have some version of lean manufacturing. They all have some version of a control system, but there are lots and lots of differences. And so training somebody on something they don't need to know to be successful in the market they're in is waste. And we need to drive out that waste. The second tip for waste pre-training is matching the training to our learner's knowledge, matching the training to the specific learner. I recently worked on a project for a large Fortune 500 manufacturing company here in the United States. We created a progressive learning program for every single one of their positions. And it looks like this. Somebody in an entry-level maintenance position has courses that apply specifically to what it is that they do. They get an introduction to mechatronics and mechatronic systems. They learn the basics of ACDC electrical circuits and basic fluid power using a basic pneumatics course. They get an introduction to lean, like 5S and visual workplace and standard work and Kaizen and a few other aspects of lean manufacturing. They learn the principles of robotics and the principles of automation. They understand a little bit about DC generators. They learn about print reading and they learn about basic measurement. Why? Because these are the competencies that their employer decided those individuals need to know in order to be successful in their position. There's all kinds of other things they could be learning, but their employer said, we want to focus on the things that drive the most results, the greatest results for that learner. And this is the list. Then when somebody is promoted to a maintenance tech two, they're learning about the introduction to industrial controls and electric relays, electronic sensors, basic hydraulics, pneumatic fittings. They learn about fasteners and they learn about gaskets, materials, both, both ferrous and non-ferrous, principles of plastics, rigging systems. How do we move large pieces of equipment around the manufacturing environment, mechanical systems, mechanical drives like shafts and pulleys and chains and measurement tools, dial calipers and micrometers, those types of equipment. Why? Because those are the types of competencies that are important to be successful in that job, as is overhead crane safety. So let's fast forward a little bit and let's move to a maintenance tech five. This is somebody at the highest level of maintenance technician. So they're learning advanced mechatronics. They're learning how to troubleshoot AC drives. 
They're learning about specific programmable logic controllers and how to troubleshoot those programmable logic controllers. They're learning about how the world of electrical systems combine with fluid power systems. Advanced machining, including gear manufacturing, they're learning about tooling for machining, really advanced mechanical drives where they get into some more complicated calculations of things like speed and torque. They get into machine vision systems, programmable logic motor control, plastic mold design, mold design, process control for pressure, and process control for thermal systems or temperature. That is what Maintenance Tech 5 needs to know to be successful in that organization. So the reason I went into so much detail on this slide is look at how specific these courses are to the individual learner's job. They're not learning things that don't apply to what they do day in and day out or what they should know how to do day in, day, day in and day out. That is how we make a learning opportunity. That is how we make a training program absolutely as efficient as it can be. So now let's talk about our third step for our third tip for waste-free training, and that is to mix it up. And what I mean by that is if you look at those training courses that we just reviewed, you're not sitting in several courses or dozens of hours of electrical systems and then dozens of hours of pneumatics and then dozens of hours of mechanical drives. As somebody who's been through training, that can get really monotonous and really boring for a learner. So look at how we are peppering through hydraulics and pneumatics and mechanical drives and lean manufacturing and mechatronics and programmable logic controllers and electric relay throughout all of these courses. So there's constant variety and that is a great way to keep the learner engaged. Now, I'm not just somebody who preaches about this training. I'm actually a product of it. About a year ago, I went through an extensive industry 4.0 training program, e-learning training program. This is what our course project progression looked like. Look at the variety of technologies that we were learning from introduction to fluid power and basic cylinder circuits on the fluid power side to control logic circuits and electric control diagrams, relay control circuits on the electrical side. We got into things like hand tools and mechanical power. We went deep into some aspects of safety and manufacturing, even peppered in some robot operation and programming into this particular course. And then we have more safety, and then we get into electrical current and power and electric circuits, introduction to electronic sensors. By the, by the way, the reason that this particular page is a little bit larger than all the rest of them is look at those quiz scores on the right-hand side and how I did on those post quizzes. If it wasn't for that handful of questions and fire and electrical safety, I would have been absolutely perfect on this section of our coursework. So I kid about that, but the truth of the matter is you can see that this works. Pre-quiz is 71%, post-quiz of 100% on types of PPE as just one example. But the point of all of this is tremendous amount of variety in what the students and learners are learning as they go through their course production, progression. So we don't get bogged down in anything. We don't spend more than an hour or two in any one single topic. How else can we drive waste out of our training? Number four, tied to credentials and to micro-credentials. Now, regular attendees to Webinar Wednesday know that we are huge fans of the Smart Automation Certification Alliance, the work that Jim Wall is doing with that organization. He's been a guest on this platform several times. This isn't the only certification for industrial technology. There are several other certifications out there. But I can tell you one of the things I love about SACA is how, is it, how it has combined micro-credentials with its credentials. So again, I'm not just preaching about this, I hold two of those credentials. I hold the Industry 4.0 Associate in Advanced Operations and the Industry 4.0 Associate in Basic Operations from the Smart Automation Certification Alliance. So part of the reason I'm a huge fan of this is I've been through the program and I know from experience how valuable it can be. Now let's think about these certifications first of all. So we can do this in a really broad format. So certifying our incumbent workers on something like basic operations or advanced operations. Those first two bullet points on the far left of that schematic, those are those two certifications that I earned. We can get into specialist level certifications, might be appropriate for somebody in a program learning competencies similar to a tech diploma or a associate degree in a community college, all the way to professional level certifications that focus on engineers, professional engineers, people working in manufacturing in a professional engineering capacity. So that's a real broad sense of what this can look like. But what I love about it is we can really, really dial it in and make it 
absolutely specific to a job. So here's an example of an Automation Specialist II certification. You can see on the left, the core micro-credentials. These are things that are really common in manufacturing environments. So if I'm gonna be an Automation Specialist, of course I need to know mechanical power systems. Of course I need to know fluid power. I need to know PLCs and ethernet, how to analyze data. I need to understand a bit about smart factory technology, things like smart sensors and smart devices. But then as we move over into those elective micro-credentials, maybe something like predictive maintenance or advanced hydraulics learning or motion control systems, those are really important in some jobs and really important in some companies in some regions, maybe less important in other companies in other regions. So we can use those electro elective micro-credentials to build up a company-specific credential, third-party credential, that an employee can earn to demonstrate that they have specific competencies. So now let's go back to that example of that big Fortune 500 company that I'm working with, and they've got different progressions for every one of their technicians. Through the use of micro-credentials, we can create a specific credential or set of micro-credentials specific to every single job on the technical side of manufacturing in our business and get really, really close to having a credential that is customized to our company. Again, it's waste-free learning. We're driving the waste of teaching somebody or credentialing somebody on technology we don't use. We're driving that out of the system. And we're focusing on the technology that we use, the competencies that our people need to know, creating a third-party credential that is validated by industry, that is tested by somebody outside our organization, so it's got validity when I post that on my LinkedIn profile. It's got validity. It's got credibility when our employees take that certificate and put it up in their cubicle, put it up at their workstation, put it up wherever it is that they spend their time to demonstrate to the world that they have those competencies and they have the ability to add value in our organization in those really specific ways. So our fifth tip, number five for waste-free training is to listen to your team and adjust on the fly. Think about Kaizen, think about continuous improvement, this big movement we've seen in the United States over the last 10 or 15 years, engaging the people on the floor who actually do the work. Let them suggest to us, let, to, let them suggest to our Kaizen teams how we could make it more efficient, how we could make it better, how we could improve their experience and how we could just as important improve the experience and the outcome for the consumer and for our customers. So we know the importance of listening to our people when it comes to our manufacturing processes. It's equally as important to listen to our people when it comes to our training program. Because as they experience learning, as they experience the program that we've put together, they will give us really, really good feedback. Let me give you just a few examples of the kinds of things that we hear from learners, the people actually going through the training program as they're experiencing it. One example is we don't really use that here. As an example, we had an advanced hydraulics course in one of our course progressions that the leadership of that particular company thought would be important. But as we looked under the hood, as we dug into, dug into the competencies, as the learners were going through that, they said, you know what, that was interesting, but we don't do that here in this company. Well, let's move that out. If we're not using it to add value to what our people are doing internally, let's pull that out of the program. And that's exactly what we did. We don't call it a machinist's rule. We get this a lot of times. You can't create a training program that calls everything exactly what it is called in every single company. So we have this term machinist rule. We actually had a learner that said to us, you know what, we don't call it a machinist rule. We've never heard that. We know what it is. We saw the picture. Okay, well, that's an indication to us that as an individual is getting into that course, we can coach them up front. Somebody who's a facilitator can coach them up front and say, you know what, you're going to hear this term when you're in the training. We might not call it that here, but here's what it is and here's what we call it in our organization. Another piece of feedback we've received. I love that virtual pneumatic skill. So we have students in virtual training that are building virtual pneumatic circuits and they really, really enjoyed that part of the training. Well, now we can go on and look at other courses that might integrate similar virtual training skills for our employees so we can provide them with the most efficient learning experience that we can. One final example, we need more hands-on training on PLCs. This was a large food producer that I was working with. They were going through the programmable logic controller e-learning for their learning program. And they said, you know what? That simulator was really cool. And we certainly know a lot more about ladder logic. We know a lot more about how a programmable logic controller operates, what it does. We understand IO, but we could really use a hands-on experience around that. 
So in that particular case, we were able to suggest a hands-on trainer to go side by side with the e-learning so that that group of students could have a hands-on experience along with their e-learning experience. Just a handful of examples of the kinds of feedback we receive from employees. And I will tell you that if you want them to get on board with a learning program, if you want them to promote it to others, there is no better way to do that than to listen to their feedback, positive and constructive, and then turn it into action in improving the program, because then they will know that you are genuine in terms of what you want to do, which is to create the most efficient, most positive, most beneficial learning experience for your team members. So those are our five tips for waste-free training, match the competencies to the job, match the training to the learner. So of those first two, competencies to the job, construction is different from machining, is different from tool making. So we need to make sure that we're accepting and understanding those nuances. We can't have a one size fits all solution to training. Match the training to the learner knowledge, but they need to know for their job. So if we match it directly to what they do day in and day out or should know how to do, that is the most efficient way to train our people. Provide variety. Nobody wants to sit and learn about electrical circuits for 20 hours, two hours a week for 10 weeks. Let's find a way to mix it up. Teach a little bit about, about electricity, teach a little bit about pneumatics, teach a little bit about advanced manufacturing. And so that way we create a really interesting progression for our employees. Tie these to credentials and micro-credentials. We can customize those credentials to the nth degree specific to the job. And as always, and in everything, listen to your people, listen to your team members. By listening to the people who actually do the work, and changing and improving the process and the program according to that feedback, we get a much more engaged learner. And over time, we get a much better training program. So let's review now everything that we talked about. Why do people leave their jobs? It's in many cases because of a lack of career growth. There's a much greater risk of somebody leaving your company because they are afraid that they don't have a career progression than somebody leaving your company because we've trained them on technology and they take those competencies somewhere else. Number two, if we want to retain our, retain our people, we have to show them a path to the future. That requires that we invest in training. And in many cases, the reasons that manufacturers and industrial employers give us for not investing in training, well, those are the very things that would be fixed if we did invest in training. So we retain our people by showing them a path for them to realize that we have to train them. And it's not that we train them, but what we train them and tying that learning opportunity specifically to what they do, where they will add the most value in our organization. That is lean learning. That is waste-free learning. That is how we drive out all of the waste from our learning processes. And in doing the five tips for waste-free training, you'll give me a long way to get in there. So that's our topic for today on how we retain our people. We retain our people by showing them a path to the future. We show them a path to the future by training them for the skills and competencies that will be necessary for them to do the next job along the progression. With that, Melissa, I'd love to hear what our audience had to say. Absolutely, Matt. And we do have a question um, here that I'm gonna pose to you in just a second and to our all of our attendees who are on live with us. If you do have any questions that you wanna ask Matt at this point, you can submit those in that Q&A box. Uh, Matt, first question is, do you recommend employee training to be mandatory or is this something that they should do as an incentive? Great question. And it really goes back to that first thing that we talked about. It is okay for an employee to say, I'm not interested in upskilling. I don't personally necessarily understand that, but there are people who are wired that way. They're happy in the job that they're doing. They don't necessarily want to be promoted. They don't necessarily have a need or a desire to make more money. They've got other priorities in their life. That is perfectly fine. But what we say is if you have an employee that isn't interested in being upskilled, you are better off leaving that employee out of your training program. Because of the truth of the matter is forcing somebody into the program, there's a really good chance that they're not gonna have the best attitude toward the training in the first place. And we all know how contagious attitudes are, especially on the manufacturing floor where everybody is working in close proximity to each other, where everybody is eating lunch together. They may even socialize together after work. It's really, really important for us to make sure that we keep our people interested and keep our people engaged in such a way that if they're interested and excited about the training program, let's let them in. And if it's not something we want to do, we're better off leaving them out. Great, thanks. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, do you use an ROI calculator that you use to prove value? That's another really good question. 
Um, now this answer is it could be as narrow or as broad as we want to make it. I'm a bean counter by background. I totally understand the need to uh, validate ROI, the need to understand that we're going to have a payback in the investments that we're making. Those are easier calculations to do in some cases than in others. Where it's really, really easy is, okay, I'm going to buy a new machining center. I can double my throughput through that machining center with the same amount of cost. Machining center is going to cost me $100,000. I'm going to save $50,000 a month. I've got a two-month payback, $50,000 a year. I have a two-year payback. That ROI is really, really simple to calculate. There's other things in business that are more difficult to calculate when it comes to ROI. Research return on investment on our marketing efforts is one example of that. It's really, really hard to tie specifically a um, the advantage or the benefit of uh, a trade show or of a marketing piece to specific benefits in the company. It doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't do it. It's harder to measure that ROI. Training is exactly the same way. It's really, when we think about all the reasons we should be training, we're reducing downtime, we're improving quality, we're improving our employee retention, we're improving our employee experience. We can create some guesstimates around what that financial impact is, but it's really, really hard to tie it back directly. The truth of the matter is when we talk about topics like this, we all understand intuitively that it's important to train our employees. Manufacturers understood that in the 1970s when the average employee received, believe it or not, 100 hours a year of skills-based training at work provided by their employer. We need to get back to that time because we all know that this is important. In terms of calculating the ROI, a little bit more difficult. I think we have to just understand the intrinsic benefits of training and then recognize that it's an investment we need to make in the future of our business. Absolutely. And Matt, just to add to that, um, we will be talking about this topic much more extensively as another topic in this 10-part series. So if you go to that landing page, you can sign up for that episode. We'll, we'll be, we will be talking about what to track, how to track it, and how to understand how that fits into the overall picture of the ROI in your training program. Um, all right. Those are all the questions, Matt. I'll leave it to you to wrap up. All right. Well, thank you, Melissa. Thanks to our guests for being with us for another edition of Webinar Wednesday. This is really important stuff. We talk about the importance of training our workforce for the future. We're going to have seven more of these discussions. Really looking forward to spending that time with you. Appreciate everybody being on board. So with that, we're going to see everybody next week. We are here every single Wednesday at two o'clock central. We'll see you next week.